today you, me, and Kwame are moving out. Hey, hi, hello, it's your favorite reader here, Miranda Reads, and I have a confession. I spend an <laughs> inordinate amount of time being licked by my dog. I spend an inordinate amount of time just fantasizing what it's like to live in literary worlds. So today we're going to be talking about literary worlds and if there was some sort of ink world situation, where would you go? Where would be the best place for you to live? And me. I, honestly, it's mostly just me. I'm, I'm basing this all about my own capabilities here. So today I picked out some of my favorite literary worlds. I also went to my Instagram and my Twitter and I crowdsourced a few more ideas. Also, I'm really excited to announce that we have finally hit a thousand subscribers. So I'm very happy to have you all joining me as I go house shopping for my literary world. The goal here is to really like think of this as like where would we be able to live? So we're gonna have to establish two important rules. Number one, we're gonna to have to accept that we're not going to be the chosen one. We're gonna be the, not even the secondary characters. We're gonna be tertiary or quaternary. Goal is just to live in this world, not to fight Voldemort. And second, we also gonna to have to accept that we might not always be human. So what we're gonna do is we're not gonna transport our human selves into these literary worlds. Instead, what we're going to do is whatever the tertiary character, quaternary characters are, that will be our species in this world. So we're going to be average rando citizen living in this world. Now, one last thing before I begin, we're going to be grading this on a sliding scale. Thrive obviously means you throw me in this world, I'ma be fine. I'ma be more than fine. Survive means I'll probably make it. Take a dive is like I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna die almost instantly. So without further ado, let's get started. I feel like Chronicles of Narnia is a classic literary world. It was one of the very first worlds I was kind of like aware of and I wanted to join. Now with Chronicles of Narnia, it is a seven book series and each book series goes to a different part of the world, a different era. We're gonna limit ourselves to the very first book, which I guess chronologically isn't the first, but the most famous of them. For that world, first of all, you are under the control of the, the White Witch. I honestly think I could survive this world. I feel like I would be able to keep my head down enough so I wouldn't get noticed by the White Witch. I think I'll be able to live without the Christmases. However, it is winter all the time. I'm not sure how people are getting food, but when we visit the Beavers, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, they were fine. They, they had enough food. They weren't starving. We wouldn't thrive in this world. I don't think we would be able to thrive in it. But I think we'd be able to do more than just surviving. So Chronicles of Narnia, I think we'll be okay. Let's go to Crescent City. Okay, so Crescent City. This is Sarah J. Maas's latest book. I have not actually finished it yet, but I'm at page 500. And at this point, I feel like I have a, a good enough grasp on the world to make this decision. Now in this world, we have technology, we have magic, and there's all the different legends are coming in together at once. So there's like vampires, there's fairies, there's angels, there's demons. They're all coalescing on earth. Humans get really, really repressed. They tried to do rebellion, it did not work. Their conditions are worse than before. A lot of the other lesser species, so lesser fae, or those who were in the rebellion are now slaves. So we have to take into account a few things. One there's grizzly murders happening. They seem to be a little bit selective, but a little bit selective more on the main characters. So they're not like a mass extinction of tertiary and quaternary characters. So that's like a benefit for us. However, the important characters are, are all the ones with really strong magic and everyone else is lesser compared to them, which is kind of Sergei Massa's MO here. If we were to be transported into this world, we'd either be human or one of the lesser creatures. And honestly, I don't think we do too well here. And I'm thinking this mostly because the lesser fae, they just aren't particularly strong. And this is kind of one of those worlds where you have to be strong to survive in the city. Now the main character's parents were human and they reportedly had a wonderful life, but they were far outside of the Crescent City. So in the middle of the Crescent City, you definitely have that power dynamic. So what I think is we could probably 
live, like we wouldn't have an instant death here, but we probably wouldn't be doing too well. So we're gonna keep it right here. Next up is The Night Court. So this will be slightly spoilery if you haven't read the second book of Sarah J. Maas's A Court of Thorns and Roses, but The Night Court, it's a dual life. There's the Under the Mountain portion and then there's Valeris. And the Under the Mountain, obviously if we were living under the mountain, instant death. The mountain is just where all of the cruel fey go, where they just constantly pick at each other and they're fighting and they're ripping each other apart. So obviously we would die. However, since this was a suggestion from one of you all, and I'm assuming that you actually did want to go there, you're probably referring to the other part of the night court, the secret part of the night court. So keeping that in mind, that one is a gorgeous city full of artists. They've been fine on their own for hundreds of years. We would probably thrive in that world, I would say. We would be an average fey character, but in the Night Court, um, we don't really have to worry about those power dynamics. You don't really have to worry about trying to prove yourself, keep yourself alive. So like definitely going to the Night Court, I think would be fine for us. So The Hazelwood is written by Melissa Albert. In The Hazelwood, there is a book called Tales from the Hinterland which is actually going to be published by the real life author of The Hazelwood upcoming pretty soon. So I'm really excited about that. But the tales from the hinterland tells these scary fairy tales. And they're kind of spooky, very eerie, very like the kind of fairy tales that you don't want your kids to read because it's too spooky. If we were to be transported into the hinterland and there is average human characters and there's also average uh, fairy tale characters. Average human characters I don't, I think we'd be roughly in the same boat as Crescent City, maybe be a little closer to take a dive. Humans have found a way to work within the fairy tale world. However, there's so many rules. I just realized that I would want to bring Squamish with me to all of these worlds. We have to slightly reevaluate them. Chronicles of Narnia, he, yeah, we're gonna keep Chronicles of Narnia where it is. Because if I brought Squamish, it would be a little bit awkward because like most of the animals are very cognizant, they're very, um, they have human intelligence. And Squamish, look at that face. <laughs> I, I think it would be alright to still bring him. The Night Court, obviously Squamish would be fine. If he was in the actual city, obviously not in the, under the mountain. Crescent City, I think he would be, we'd probably still be at the same stage because there's a lot of pets in Crescent City. But like I don't see very many like normal dogs, so I'd be a little bit worried about him. So the Hazelwood. So if we were humans in the Hazelwood, and we brought Squamish, covering his ears, but he would not make it. And if we were creatures in the Hazelwood, so if we were part of like the average background fairy tale characters, well these are the scary fairy tale characters. We would be murdered, assassinated, depending on our importance of the story. Squamish, he might make it out, but there's too many creatures in there willing to kill him. So, because of that, if we were to go to the Hazelwood, we would just take a dive. I'm just being realistic here. Like, there's just not much of a chance for us in this world. So, Pan Am is from The Hunger Games. It's post-apocalyptic. United States is split up according to like, what their region produces and that's all you can do for your lives. If we're going to be the average background character, we would probably be in District 12 with Katniss. Be very, very hungry most of the time, so right away we're going, we know that we are going to thrive. Squamish, I don't want to say it, but um, there wasn't much of a reason for many pets. Now Katniss did keep a cat. But I would be a little bit worried how difficult it would be to keep a dog, especially with so many people starving next door. However, he is very good at chasing after small things. He could be a ragger. Because of all of those reasonings, I would put Pan Am as survive. Definitely won't be a very good time, but we will be surviving. So this one is actually from a book series and it's called Archibald Finch and the Last Witches. The first book is out and that's actually what you're seeing on there and it is a gorgeously illustrated book. The main character gets transported, his whole bedroom mostly gets transported to the Gristlemouth and then he has to figure out how to try and get out of this alternate world. If I was an average background character that means I would probably be one of the witches in the Gristlemouth 
and that means I probably would have the training behind a lot of their activities. I think this one I, I could survive it. Definitely would not be thriving, especially with the threat of turning into one of the creatures in this story every time you leave your safe base. However, I think it's doable. Alright, so next up we have Monster Land. In this series, the apocalypse has come and gone already. The world is starting to get back on its feet and we have these monster lands opening up which are like these massive structures designed to showcase vampires, werewolves, and zombies. And the general public can come see it. And everyone at first is very, very excited about the monster lands opening up because for the first time in a long time since the apocalypse hit, the economy is taking a turn for the better. People are having jobs again. However, of course, if you put a lot of monsters together, hmm, well, it's not generally not a good thing. So if I was an average character in this book, so first of all, if it was me in this, I would survive the first wave of the apocalypse. I would probably survive the second and third waves as well. Because literally, I would be hiding in my house. I am very good at being frugal. I'm very good at hiding. I don't really need a lot of social interaction. Because of that, I think I would survive Monsterland. However, we have to keep in mind that we are an average character in this book. An average character in this book goes to the Monsterland Grand Ope. Guamish would be fine because he would stay home. So like, that's good. However, if I go to the Monsterland Grand Opening and something were to go wrong, I would probably be one of the first to die. I would definitely not do well, and I'd probably be closer to taking a dive. I'll put it about halfway through, because real life Miranda would absolutely not, never even be in this situation. Average character Miranda would probably ditch the first sign of issue, so like, I would say 50-50 whether or not I live. So next up we have The Other World. So this book four focuses on Coraline and she's having a very, very boring day. And she finds a key to a door in her house that she never knew about. And she opens it and she crawls into a different world. And she meets the other mother. And the other mother is just like her mother, except for she does everything opposite. So Coraline gets all kinds of toys, she gets all kinds of treats, but there's something, there's something off with the other mother. And you quickly find out that the other mother does not have Coraline's best interests at heart. And it's a very like scary, scary book. When I was a kid, I was actually like, so cowardly. I'd never even like bothered trying to read Coraline. I just read the back and I'm like, I'm out, I'm out. <laughs> When I was an adult reading this for the first time, like my heart was racing. Um, average background character. There really isn't a background character in this book. All of the characters in here are important to the story. Keeping that in mind, I'm gonna put myself into Coraline's place. I honestly don't know if I would have made it. At her age, I was I was very much like a freeze and be scared kind of kid. Like so keeping in mind my skill level at Coraline's age, I'm gonna say I, I wouldn't survive the other world. I would probably die. I would not have had Squamish yet, so we don't have to worry about him. Alright, so left up we have the Shire. So this one comes from the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Thing is for a certain, I love the Hobbit. I've read the Hobbit so many times. It's one of my favorite books. So one of my favorite literary worlds to imagine myself in is The Shire. Now keeping in mind some pros and cons when it comes to The Shire. Huge con right away. Your feet will be huge and hairy because you will be a hobbit. A big plus though is that it's a very comfortable life. There's always plenty of food. There's tons of friends and tons of family. Apparently it can get a little bit weary, some if we were to believe Bilbo. And there's always a chance that Gandalf the Grey comes to your house and kidnaps you for an adventure. However, comma, Gandalf has taken maybe two hobbits on adventures. So like the odds are pretty low. And both hobbits survived, which was great. So because of that, I think Rive in the Shire. I would absolutely love that simple country life. And Squamish, he would have probably the best life he could possibly have in this book. And then last but certainly not least is Hogwarts. For the most part Hogwarts would be a fairly safe place and since we are not the chosen one we really don't have to worry about Voldemort coming after us, the Death Eaters coming after us. We would probably be fine I would say. It'd be really disappointing that Squamish could not come with me because they only allow cats and owls and toads but I could probably do some sort of spell and make you into a cat. 
Who do you want to be a cat? Of all the places to go, I probably love going to Hogwarts the most. The absolute most. As a kid, I loved school. I loved learning about science. I loved learning about math. But what I loved the most was reading Harry Potter. Because I loved all of the lessons. It always like frustrated me when Harry and Ron wouldn't want to do their homework. I'm like, you're doing freaking magic homework. Like, who doesn't want to do that? I mean, like, it can't just be me who loves magic homework. Like, it, it just can't. So obviously, with Hogwarts, we're going to thrive in this world. Like, it's gonna be amazing. It's also like a stable enough world that if we just keep our heads down and let the main characters do what they want, we'll be fine. Keeping in mind all three of these under Thrive, I would say probably the best bet for survival if we all were to collectively go to a literary world would be the Shire. And I know it's not the most exciting of the worlds, however it is the one where we would have that almost guaranteed survival aspect to it. Between Hogwarts and the Night Court, I would say I'd probably want to go to Hogwarts mostly because the night court is exciting and everything but there is a war happening where a lot of people die. I know there's somewhat a war happening with, at Hogwarts as well but I feel like my odds of surviving that as, I'm a, as a tertiary character are way higher than surviving um, the war in the night court. So yeah, that's it. We're, that's where we need to move. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching and happy reading. Bye!